Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Amy Barnhart Bond. Um, those of you who know the show know that Grace Under Pressure is an interview show where we talk to thought leaders and doers like Amy, who are helping us understand ourselves better. Grace Under Pressure reveals what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, you know, uh, the caring, the commitment and that we exert toward one another. And Grace focuses on generosity, respect, and compassion. And when you do it as a leader, especially in challenging times, uh, it requires the ability to act for others and mobilize people toward uh, common cause. Welcome, Amy. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much, John. I love your show and I love its purpose. Well, thank you. And now I want to tell the folks all about you, uh, Amy. Uh, Barnard Bond is a former Fortune Global 500 executive. Uh, she's a consultant to C-suite and leaders because she's been one. And uh, she's worked at companies like Bankwest, Adobe, and Gap. She's recognized by Forbes as one of the top coaches for legal and compliance. And gosh, I wonder how that is because she's also a JD, where she's a graduate of my alma mater, Georgetown. She went to the law school. I'm an undergrad. <laughs> I, they'd never let me into the law school. We're still <laughs> highest, John. <laughs> and so um, she is also a member of Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches. She guest lectures at Stanford and UC Berkeley, and she's contributed to Harvard Business Review, Fast Company, and Compliance Week. She's a fellow at the Harvard Institute of Coaching. And um, she has a, some, a, a tool called the Promotability, Promotability Index, and I will put notes on to how to get it in our uh, file. Amy, welcome. Thank you, John. Great. Our world has been turned upside down, uh, We, as we all know. So what are you hearing from the executives with whom you work? Gosh, a lot. <laughs> um, as I'm sure you have with your clients, John, I work with a wide range of clients. And given the pandemic, the focus that I work on with them depends on the industry to some degree. So some are thriving, like tech, um, and some are just surviving, like some of my med device and healthcare clients. Sure. Um, what I would say the similarities are is that they're all staying really nimble with their strategic focus. Um, they're executing or pivoting their business engagement with their teams and they're exploring return to work. Um, and whether that's like going to be a hybrid, which, you know, a partial remote or partial in-person situation okay. in the future. Um, in terms of their footprint. And they're also managing burnout, both on an organizational level and on a personal level. Okay. Well, tell me about the burnout. What do you think? I mean, that's an issue. I know it certainly in the medical community with physicians and things like that, and more now than ever with the uh, uh, yeah. spiking of COVID. But what, uh, what are you noticing about burnout in general? Well, do you mean for organizations and how they should yeah. approach it or for the individual, individual. leaders? Yeah. For individual leaders, I would say it's never been more important to set personal and professional boundaries. I've I've never been great at this, I have to admit, John. I've been an executive. <laughs> oh, because, you're high, because you're a high achieving <laughs> person. So that's I mean, you know, it was almost easier when I was an executive, which isn't saying much. I have to tell you, if you asked my my daughters and family. Um I was always working. And so as a solopreneur, it's it's not, you know, better. Um, but I would say I've appreciated that it's even more important to whatever works for you, make sure you get your, for me, it's at least seven hours sleep. I'm, I'm better with seven and a half. I can manage with six, but if I get below six a couple days in a row, I really notice it in my performance. So I'm, I've prioritized sleep mm -hmm. and I've created um, sleep rituals that I wasn't disciplined enough and didn't really need to have the discipline of before COVID. It's actually forced me to be more disciplined. Mm -hmm. um, I block, I'm using more blocking time. Um, Cal Newport, one of our Hoya colleagues has some really great information about how to use time blocking to be efficient, including blocking time for yourself. Right. Um, my daughter is collaging from home. And she's fantastic at coming in and interrupting me um, and having me go out for walks or actually eating lunch at a normal time, um, which has also been fantastic. And I recently read 
um, a really fun article that was talking about how people who are realizing this is going to go on a lot longer than maybe some people had hoped in terms of the working remote for people who are fortunate enough to be in a position where they can still continue to work remote. And I recognize that a lot of people in some industries have had to work this whole time. Um, but for those who have worked remote and actually miss their commute, John, there was an article about um, people are, some people are fabricating a commute. They're actually um, getting up in the morning, getting in the car, creating a fake commute, driving around, kind of doing their thinking, listening to their podcast, having their cup of coffee, doing a Starbucks drive through or whatever it is, and then coming home and, and starting their day and finding that it resets them, yeah. um, which I found really fascinating because it, it shows yeah. how we need, we sometimes need to know ourselves well enough to know what works for us. So I work with each of my clients on what works for you. How can you take a pause? How can you stop work when the boundaries between the personal and the professional have all been eradicated at this point. It started with blackberries and and currently it's the pandemic in terms of this 24 seven on for executives. I know, and, and that's the the uh, thing about burnout is uh, at, at glance, and you know, this would have been months ago, you, you we might have thought, well, how can you be burned out because you're working from home? But it's just the opposite because that 24 seven cycle is ceaseless. Um, we have a colleague, you know, uh, Maury Barrett, who has a morning commute. Hers is not in a car. Hers is a walk around her neighborhood, which she does. Nice. And she also takes her lunch break um, is that same commute in that quick walk. So she's doing it. And um, she also has, Maura has something interesting called airport time. She used to travel, obviously, as many of us did. So um, so she, now she says, well, I'm not going to fly anywhere. But what I what she did on airplanes was read for pleasure, not for business. Mm. So she budgets time per week to have her pleasure reading or whatever she would traditionally do on an airplane. But it's getting to what your point was, Amy. How do we manage this time? And this is what the things, the lessons we need to share with our clients. Correct. I'm sorry. Yeah, and I'll even leave. I block Fridays for writing and mm -hmm. strategic planning. And I will uh, when we had the shutdown, and it may happen again. I would actually leave the house and go to a closed cafe, bring my own tea and sit for three hours. And just being in a different space, which was my airport time, I would work on airplanes and write. And I loved not being reachable by phone and mm -hmm. I would not buy the Wi-Fi, yeah. so, that, so that I, you know, so that I just had the three hours to really write and focus on client issues and I loved it. And so that's been my hijack. Great. Now let's switch it a little bit. Thank you for your candor and sharing your personal experiences managing time. Um, you mentioned hybrid office. So where are, because I have some clients who I think, because they have lovely facilities, they think people want to come back, but a significant number may not want to. So what are you hearing? It's a That's why I'm hearing hybrid, John. Um, I think people have learned which type they are by now. Um, you know, I have a 15-year-old introverted daughter and she's high schooling from the dining room and she feels like she was born for this moment. She is thrilled <laughs> to yeah. not have to go to yeah. school. She's on one end of the extreme. My other daughter who's colleging in the kitchen is dying to go to college and be with people and meet people. And I would say that trues up with my work clients as well. Um, I have work clients who are dying to be back and have that teamwork, the water cooler talk, the camaraderie, particularly people who are in functions that require a lot of networking and a lot of informal qualitative data to feel connected and to feel like they know, like they have their finger on the pulse. CEOs that are, you know, love to be with their people and feel like, am I leading well? Am I connecting? Is my message resonating? Do I have all the information I need? You know, those drive-bys that people used to drop by your desk and just say, hey, do you have a minute? I don't know about you, but those are some of the most important conversations I've ever had as an executive. Usually someone's been worried about something or they really want to run an important idea by you and they don't want to write an email and they don't want to pick up the phone. 
Well, um, the thing I, when I have these conversations with executives and, and we know it is we are human beings. We are not wired for the five by seven screen or even if it's 30 inch screen, um, we crave human contact. Um, and um, so we need that interaction. Uh, but it's just as we plot around what happens next, it's a question that we need to uh, explore. And I, as I say to leaders, this will be a PhD dissertation topic for many folks going forward. I said, but now you are, have to answer questions now. And, and that's the challenge. So great. People like the workplace flexibility. You know, they've been begging for that for a long time. So we've got that. So the question is then how far do we rotate back, right? So. Great. Now I want to um, switch to your sweet spot, as mentioned, you're a Georgetown Law grad, and you focus on the ethical workplace. Tell me what that means. So, Gosh, an ethical workplace to me is, is a fundamental question that I am so curious about and always learning how to help companies effectively implement. And it's around corporate a balance of corporate governance, workplace culture, and effective leadership. And I think the big question is, how do we organize and lead our organizations in a way that delivers innovative solutions and long-term sustainable value to sh shareholders and stakeholders and employees in our communities at large? So that, that's what ethical workplaces mean to me. It's, it's thinking of all of those stakeholders and how do we create a business model that sustainably serves all of them. It was not too long ago, last fall, uh, that the um, conference board issued a new um, purpose statement, if you will, and yeah. moved from shareholder value to stakeholder value. Is that what you're talking about? Well, I've, I've always been in this space. It's been 25 years. So I was. Well, why didn't they listen to you, Amy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not that powerful, John. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know, but I'm excited. Um, you know, I, I've, I have felt the momentum. I think that climate change has had a huge impact on that. I think that the drive and push for companies needing to, uh, work more efficiently and recognizing the gains to be had with diversity and um, leveraging all of our talent with, as you know, I've been an advocate for women on boards and with only 20% of women on boards, we know by definition when women are 55% of the population and more than that college graduates and only 20 are on boards. Um, we know we're not leveraging our best talent, no hit to men. We need really strong, amazing, smart men as well. Um, and there are other people that, that we can bring to the table. So I would say that, um, and the NACD is considering actually, I just read that yesterday, they just, just announced potentially requiring women on boards, which is fascinating. Um, because well, you know, research has shown, and you wouldn't be the expert in this, that when women are um, at least 50 50 on a board, culture changes, but de but decision-making changes too. And it's like, well, duh, but organizations <laughs> come out better, uh, or at least uh, would, um, and uh, do you have a comment on that? So, uh, Yeah, I think we need balanced boards. You know, gender's just one piece of it. I'm also a big advocate for including risk professionals and more, um, leaders who manage reputational risk, whether it's HR or legal or compliance on boards. And I, I think we don't have to look far at the corporate governance crises and failures. And unfortunately, in a down economy, we usually see a lag time a couple of years from now when regulatory enforcement kicks back up again. And we kind of to use to, to paraphrase Warren Buffett, when we see when we see who's been swimming naked, um, we're going to start to see some significant fraud, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, we're going to see uh, people who have cut corners based on financial pressures, which are understandable, but unwise from a sustainability perspective, right. whether it's supply chain or vendor management and that kind of thing, data privacy, hacking. There's a lot to be uh, thinking about right now. And so it doesn't surprise me in that sense because um, we're moving, we're in such a global world, John. And so mm -hmm. it's pretty rare now that you have a, an impactful company that doesn't have all of these different things that they have to be holding 
their employees that expect to be expect pay transparency, which is another area I've been exploring lately. Mm -hmm. um, after BLM and Me Too, this generation, um, you know, expects to be able to bring more of their so themselves to work. That's very different than baby boomers. So yeah. it's a fascinating time to figure all of this out. Well, no, but it's neat. It's needed too. And 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 I'm going to th throw a wrench here, and uh, you can slap me if I'm not. <laughs> Because you work in the area of compliance, um, which right. is necessary and stuff like that. Is there new thinking? Uh, compliance to me means follow the rules. Mm -hmm. Is there a more holistic way of doing it rather than, you know, uh, the old Google saying, do no harm? I mean, I know that's, you know, Pollyannish, but is yeah. there a bigger shift in that, do you think? So. Gosh, for me, that's the space I've always worked in. And so for me, it's been an integration of um, compliance and ethics and human resources practices. I've, I've been both a CHRO and a compliance officer because right. for me, um, those are both culture drivers along with finance and strategy. Those are, those are critical people to all be working together. And I often write and speak about how the importance of those having a really tight cross-functional relationship because they shouldn't be siloed. So I kind of cringe when I when I think of compliance as just following the rules because it's so much more than that. It's what I've it's what we just talked about. That right. to me is is compliance, but I understand because the word is so it's a it's a loaded word, right? right? It's become it's become very boring, frankly, and very um uh, just tight and it's, to me no it's not what that means at all well that's why i thought you, you would yeah and when i talk to when i talk to our compliance officers john we've moved so far this profession people tend to think of them as auditors and i think if i had 50 of my colleagues in here you would you would love the conversations that we're having it's about exactly what we're talking about it is not about check the box training and firing people for one little mistake. It's not about that at all. That's not where the profession is. No, that's wonderful because it's, it's yeah. what I think the underlying concept of that is holistic. And the way you said that we're compliance yeah. must be it because you've actually straddled it because you've been a CHRO, yeah. um, human resources, and also that. So you have that perspective, but you also have the business background with matching strategy and all that effect on the culture. So um, gonna, I'm going to shift you back into the HR role here. So um What's the what are you seeing on uh, the impact of the crisis to date on culture? Pluses, minuses? Yeah, the pl I'll start with the plus because yeah. I'm an optimist and that excites me. Um, I have been doing a lot of thinking about this uh, from home since I've been tethered to my office. And what I love about crisis, I've decided, is that it breaks open the old ways of doing things. Mm hmm. In pretty much all of my former executive roles, I led major transformational change initiatives. So I'm very um, sensitive and aware of momentum when when we have it, how to build it, when it's peaking and when it's gone. And so I support all my executive coaching clients in leading with their change efforts and how to pivot. And so this is a very exciting time because um, there is momentum and there's a climate for change because we're already disrupted. All of our routines, were disrupted and normally to make great change, and you've probably coached clients with this too, John, you actually have to create those conditions and that takes a lot of work and potentially a lot of time, depending on the maturity of the organization, the business cycles, right? Whether there's a mandate from the board, all these factors. Right now, we're kind of living, we're kind of being handed that. So that's the silver lining to me is, you know, for example, some issues we avoided or changes that organizations said, over my dead body. I will never allow work from home. Yeah. Do, you remember that? Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. I mean, that was only nine months ago, okay, yeah. um, that it was a, a big deal. Um, some some older industry clients, and I have them, and I've worked with them, you know, and I've had to implement and, and kind of try to, I remember fighting for, like, flexible work schedules for, for non-exempt employees and dealing with that years ago in HR. And we were also having to pay attention to diversity issues like Me Too and Black Lives Matter that we might not have been quiet enough to really focus on. And all being at home, um, you know, I think employees are focused a lot more 
this is the down or upside, I think, for, for organizations is employees are looking for, they're really paying attention to how they're being treated now because all the distraction is removed, whether it was the free food, if you're at one of my Silicon Valley companies and the ping pong and the golf, the golf putting greens, yeah. um, or, you know, whether it's just whether your manager meets with you regularly and gives feed forward that's helpful in your career right. and care, cares about your development as an employee, not just at the company you're at, but in the future. So, um, you know, in some of my speaking industry associations, like, like for Georgetown, Hoyas, um, I take an anonymous poll, John, and I give people um, like three or four options. And I just say, hey, you know, are you thrilled with your job and feeling like you're on track for promotion and learning? Or are you, you know, content, but like keeping an eye out for an opportunity? Or are you miserable and you're actively looking and you will leave for the next good opportunity? And it's fascinating to see the breakdown on the on the polling. And about a third are miserable. Yeah. If I were to, this is rough science here, but like a lot of people are gonna leave as soon as they can, which may not be for a while. People need financial stability, sure. um, but that probably means they're not happy. And so organizations really need to pay attention to that because this um, pandemic has stripped away kind of any fluffy, you know, golden linings we might've had in our work environments. And so it's very um, stark, I think. Well, that's, I think it's, I, I, I like your analogy of um, uh, when you get away from the facility, the building, whatever, yeah. you, you are, you're isolated, which is always, I mean, that's an emotional indicator. And there are, you know, uh, we've on this show, we've had psychiatrists and psychologists and sadly, uh, clinical depression or mm -hmm certainly manifest in clinical anxieties at least 20 percent you know so that's not but all of us are feeling anxious that's not necessarily clinical so it's not the upside of that is we're asking questions about what do i want to do with the rest of my life type thing and that's good always good to ask those questions the danger becomes when it's um you get uh, trapped in a maze and overly ruminative thinking and so some of this is it's mm -hmm. we've really exposed some of our raw nerves and stuff so it's a tough tough world but um so anyway switching gears even more okay when we talk culture um too often we equate that with hr but um what's the better more holistic look at it from your perspective amy so gosh i think leaders need to just appreciate how much they set the culture there it's a huge responsibility and incredible opportunity mm -hmm. and i hope that most ceos love love thinking about that and finding out how they can leverage their teams to to think about culture and what is their culture in a remote environment i think that's a common question that I'm that I'm working with a lot of executives on right now. And how do they, especially when, with onboarding, yeah. you know, re remote recruitment. I have a general counsel client who had to onboard and recruit a new CEO completely remotely. What a challenge! <laughs> what a challenge! Yeah, and had to 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 be really clear about what is the culture now and where did she see the gaps and, and what is the opportunity and is this person a fit and are they up for the task? Okay. You know, it's interesting. Um, one might think that at first glance, that is hard and extremely hard, but at the same time, getting back to what you said, which is kind of the burning platform process, Hey, everything's broken now. So let's start <laughs> over again in a way. Yeah. Would you agree? So it's a tremendous opportunity for someone who is all in, yeah. right? who's right. really paying attention and who, who really cares. Right. Now the a question since you've been on um, HR, but also uh, um, an attorney and a woman. So <laughs> my question is um, ambition. Men are praised mm -hmm. for it. Women are mm, not so much. So is yeah. that changing? So what's the question? Sorry. So is the idea of, of, um, Ambition is praised in men, but viewed negatively among women. Is or, or, excuse me, within women, is that changing? Do you think? So. I think so. I hope so. I would. I would tell all women, this is your life. You know, figure out what you want and just go for it. Mm -hmm. 
it's and it's okay to be a bit terrified. I think I think that men maybe don't talk about their fear and maybe they don't have it as much. But I think that perhaps for women who have followed men mostly, um, just in terms of leadership roles, it's just been the way it's happened. Right. Um, maybe they don't think they should feel scared and maybe that impacts their confidence. I was speaking to a young woman yesterday after a, a women on board event events. And I just said, you know, if it's scaring you, that's you're actually learning. There was this wonderful Yale study. And I talked about this in my recent newsletter that's coming out that literally talks about John, how when we're learning our brain center lights up. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that, um, that when we're confronted with stressful unpredictability, which is all the time, <laughs> maybe, yeah. maybe right now, um, that's actually when we're learning mm -hmm. and when we're using our full humanity, to use your word, and it goes dark, our brain literally goes dark when we're not learning and we're doing comfortable routine tasks. And look, we can't like always be learning or, or um, we would burn out to, okay. to go to your earlier point about balance. But there are some entrepreneurs and leaders that advocate trying to shoot for a goal of 70% like things that scare you mm -hmm. in order to, um, it's, it's the best way you can accelerate your learning. Sure. Right. And so I would, I would, I kind of see that aligned with your question with women and ambition. Like, I think, I think we need to be clear that achieving our goal sometimes is going to be terrifying. I've done all kinds of things that scare me this year but it also makes me feel alive. Right. And so I would just encourage people just to, to go for it. You know? I'm, I'm glad, I'm so glad you mentioned the idea of fear and ambition because I hadn't expressed that, I hadn't heard it expressed that way. And, and, but it's really good. And it ties into where we are right now with a sense of resilience. And I, you know, I've talked to special forces people, email oh, sure. yeah. and you know, the way they, they always feel fear. And if they don't, they'd be crazy. Um, but, it's the management of it. Um, courage is, you know, as so many people have said. So acknowledging it and that the good advice that you gave to that young woman is essentially own it and recognize that it's part of the maturation process. Would you agree? So absolutely. It's yeah. it's just part of it. Yeah. Getting getting out of your comfort zone is a common phrase people are using right now. Yeah. But I, I would say people should boss back fear. <laughs> that's good. I like that. Boss yeah. back fear. That's a yeah. good one. Just so well, back to it. It's never going <laughs> to go away. It doesn't, you can't suppress it. Uh, yeah. Would you say, John, like you have to just like be like, okay, you're here right now and yeah. uh, that's okay. And I'm just going to move forward anyway. Yeah, that's good. And it, and um, I've, I've, so many of the women leaders like yourself that I've spoken to when they talk about read, uh, ambition is um, they say, own it. So, yeah. Yeah. So don't, don't sublimate it. So, um, and, and that ties into uh, women in leadership roles and the role of assertiveness. So mm -hmm. um, what advice do you give young women on being assertive? So. That can be a little, it's a little more of an art. I would say, John, I would say in general, leaders need a balance of two things, assertiveness mm -hmm. and approachability, just right. to, really get it down to sim simple terms. Yeah. Um, and currently what I see is the difference between women and men um, in leadership is that on balance, women need to be more approachable mm -hmm. than men do to be successful and to get promoted. And it's a lot of what happens in my coaching. Um, and it might not be fair, but it is what it is. And it's also yeah. been called the likability penalty, which came yeah. up a lot, a lot, you know, particularly for political leaders. Yes. And um, men can tip towards more assertiveness and still not get punished. And women have to be- No, it's viewed as a strength. So, right? Uh, yeah. Right, a little more careful about that. And, and um, I think this is changing, yep. but I think two things. Number one, women need to give each other a break. Women need to recognize when they're doing that to other women and uh -huh. we need to have each other's back. And, um, and, you know, support each other and be an echo chamber for each other. Make sure we're getting credit in meetings that if we're interrupted, we say, excuse me, you know, so-and-so was speaking. Um, and likewise, male allies, such as yourself, John, I saw your article yesterday um, that I really appreciated in Forbes. And um, we need male allies. And thank God there are a lot of them out there. And so 
um, sponsorship is so critical for women. And, and um, there's so many men in my life who helped me, you know, reach the C-suite in my different roles. Right. And women need to help each other and men need to help women. Right. I love that concept of uh, sponsorship. I know it's been around for a while, but it was new to me. And it was introduced to me by our colleague, Fiona McCauley, who oh, said yeah. She's amazing. sponsorship is, um, is when they talk about you outside the room and, and, yes. and not in it, but saying Amy could do that or, you know, Sally's the one to do that. So what a powerful concept. And mm -hmm. that's what we need. So more of it. Yeah. My big promotions, you know, at least mostly were, were men because more men are in power, right? Just yeah. for, by the numbers. And so if there aren't allies, it's not going to happen. Right. So we have to have everybody kind of acknowledging talent. Um, and then of course, for people of color as well. So without question, you know, yeah. must maximize this opportunity yeah. because a, it's a, it's better for our companies. It's better for organizations. It's better for our society. You know, so we all learn. Yeah. So um, this has been fascinating. I can keep on going and going and going, but I like to ask all of my guests a question about grace. Do you have something you would like to share, Amy? Yeah, yeah thank you. And you wrote that beautiful book, John. Um, I would say my example is uh, when I had one of the, my biggest breaks in terms of my professional career, I was given an opportunity um, to be a chief administrative officer. So this was... Um, really bringing me into the C-suite and having about half the company report to me. And, but it was, I was headhunted and it would required relocating from the Bay area where we had lived and raised, my husband and I had ra lived and raised a family for 22 years. And um, it was the only place my daughters had ever known. And they were in fifth and eighth grade at the time. And so for any parents out there, you probably know that's not always the best time wow. to uproot your kids. They're starting to get really settled with their friend groups and develop as little people. Um, and my husband had been very happy as company. He had been there for about 10 years um, and was doing quite well. And so um, it was a big family decision. And I felt a state of grace at how they responded to my opportunity. Um, they kept it an adventure and they were really supportive of me. And to this day, John, I, I actually don't remember them complaining once, which mm. I find astounding I for, know. again, for fifth and eighth graders. And I've occasionally checked in with them and I've said, you know, what do you think? Was this the right thing to do? And they've, they've all been like, oh, we've, we've become more resilient. We've, we know how to manage change. If we had just stayed, we would have never moved until going to college and that kind of thing. And same with my husband. And I'm, I'm just really grateful for that. Yeah, that's a wonderful, what a wonderful story. And uh, grace can often come with our family and from our children, from wherever. And so thank you very much. Amy, how can people find you? So I'm pretty easy to find because of my name, A-M-I-I. -I, so you just do a search. Um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn in all the places. I'm on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Um, my website, barnardbond.com has a lot of free leadership resources. And then I think, as you mentioned, John, earlier, which I appreciate, I launched a leadership free leadership assessment tool that I've gotten great feedback on from people, especially during the pandemic, because a lot of people have been uprooted from their jobs or they're worried about the future. And so you can get that by texting, promote me to 44222. And it's an 82 question assessment that I think people feel are a lot is a lot of fun. And it, it gives you immediate ideas about what you can do to to keep growing during this time when I think some people feel they're they're not necessarily supported in their career. Great. Thank you. We will put those notes in the um, YouTube video. So thank you very much, Amy. Um, you've been a great guest. And with that. Oh, thank you, John. Thanks for having me. Close out.